Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014. Brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back everyone here live in San Francisco, California for VMworld 2014. This is theCUBE, our fifth year at VMworld. Dave, Vellante, and myself, my co-host. Uh, really, really great event. Certainly all the innovations happening here within the enterprise. Our next guest is a disruptor of that enterprise creating value, D. Raj Pandey, CEO of Nutanix. Uh, one of the hottest companies here in, in VMworld. We just had the CEO of Docker on, on the app side. Um, Nutanix certainly uh, getting all the ink these days in terms of uh, success and also uh, the, with EVO Rails <laughs> highlights this new model. Congratulations and welcome back uh, to theCUBE. Thank you, thank you. This is my uh, third time to the theCUBE and right. my fourth time probably. Yeah, so theCUBE alumni for sure. We love having you on because your experience, you've been through many innovation cycles. You've seen, uh, you've seen them come and go and this one is really different. It's got a big inflection point, it's happening very fast. Um, and so I just want get, to get some quick things out of the way. You guys just announced this morning uh, $140 million of fat financing at a $2 billion valuation. Uh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, was it a hard sell or were they like lining up to hand their cash over to you? Yeah, I mean, this time around we said we got to just go and build a relationship with the best investors who will buy into the IPO as well. And uh, it was about the character of the investors more so than just trying to get another 10% better valuation or something, you know. I said you let the East Coast guys in, so thank <laughs> yeah, you for that. Absolutely. You know, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Give a little love to the you East know, Coast. They, they need some help over there, because <laughs> California is where all the action is. Hate uh, to say they, it, it's true. Yeah, Boston has character. In there. <laughs> they're, 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 they're They'll long pay investors, and, uh, <laughs> and they actually want to go and build a long-term disruptor as well, you know. So, um, we had a big conversation with Greylock, NEA, when they were on here, Steve Herod at, uh, um, at uh, General Catalyst, and also Frank Cartelli, all VCs. This pre-IPO financing trend is huge. It's like a, a pre-IPO IPO, where there's a lot of action going on. I mean, that's a lot of cash you raise. You could probably raise more. I think it's the headline we're going to run with the Silicon Angle. That's good cash, that's like an IPO. So, you know, everyone's kind of getting liquid. So I got to ask you the question, um, do the employees sell, do the preferred stock sell? I mean, Cloudera, other ones, you know, they had liquidity from the investors on their kind of pre-IPO liquidity. Talk about the liquidity, did you guys yeah. sell? No, none of us sold actually. In fact, uh, none of the existing investors sold and none of the founders or commoners actually sold. This was, uh, I mean, people believe in this company. No like, one you know, sold. No, no one common, sold. no preferred, no one sold. Yeah, common just added more and said, you know what, uh, sorry, uh, the company just added more. Hot deal though, you could have structured it that way, I yeah, presume, absolutely. but you absolutely. chose not to. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, I mean, I talk about this in my blog, which I wrote today as well. It's, it's, uh, the, it's titled, The Baton is Passing. And uh, I talk about uh, what it really means to build a large business and how we are scratching the surface of it actually. You know? So what people think of us today is basically boxing us in with a category like hyper-converged and you know, uh, converged infrastructure and so on. But what we're really building is a, is a company that's much bigger than that actually. Yeah, now we've had previous CUBE conversations where we talk about how to build a company versus a quick flip and you guys, hats off to you guys, congratulations. I know it's been a hard road. It looks easy from the outside when you get all the financing. Um, but I got to ask you about uh, the hard part now, which is you know, sustaining the performance. You're on a $200 million run rate. You have Docker out there, completely Dockerizing on the app level. Certainly developers are buying into their model. Love containerization. It's got an open source with a twist. The more you contribute, the better the platform and ecosystem gets. But the whole idea is to shield infrastructure from developers. So you're on the other side. So how do you guys look at that? Are you guys the other side making Docker easier? Can you explain your role in that trend? Sure. I mean, you know, if you look at uh, two years ago, three years ago, AWS was the hottest trend for developers. And now it's in the private cloud, what can Docker do for you or something. Uh, and when we were looking at AWS, we said, you know, we got to integrate AWS with the rest of the infrastructure, with the rest of virtualization that people, IT does actually. And uh, it's about seamlessly integrating everything together. I think uh, if people want self-service apps with Docker, they'll need self-service ways to debug performance issues, debug faults, and things like that. So there's a lot of analytics that needs to be done on top of that stuff. I mean, Docker is an orchestrator. It's, it's, you can go and provision, deprovision, you can figure out a way to box things up together and move things around as a, as a container. But at the end of it all, once you've provisioned it, now what? Right? I mean, uh, once the app has taken a life of its own, there's a lot of hand-holding to really figure out why it's running slow, does it need to move, 
uh, you know, a, there's a ton of analytics to be done. So provisioning used to be a hard thing, but now it's almost table stakes. Okay, I got provision easily, stand up infrastructure, load apps with the container, whatnot. So provisioning, check the box, innovation's done. But now with the life cycle of apps in a dynamic environment, you need policy, you got to be program about, programmable. What does that do for the infrastructure? So, you know, is it a big data problem? Is it the software stack? What's the, what's the enabler for the developer not to worry that the infrastructure is going to break? And how do they do policy? Sure, I mean, you know, I give an analogy like, you know, software defined data centers still need silicon to run. So you can't get rid of hardware simply because software defined data centers are software defined. Similarly, when you actually decouple the app from the infrastructure, you still have to live with the infrastructure because an app will not just run in a vacuum, right? So the, those integration points, those touch points are exactly what Nutanix will bring to the table. It's like, you know, you look at this uh, new way of sandboxing something, how do you actually go and meld it with the rest of the infrastructure, you know, starting with configuration management and policies, because Docker provides a good mechanism, but how do you really put policies on top of it so that it's about security and performance and monitoring and, and fault analysis and things like that. You know. so so, there's a lot of big data to be done on top of it. So everybody's talking about sort of hyper-converged the show. Uh, Steve Harrod said, well, it's interesting. On the one hand, it's confirmation for guys like you. On the other hand, it's everybody's starting to wonder, okay, what does this all mean? What does it all mean? Uh, is, is VMware essentially taking a Larry Ellison type of approach, trying to you know, create through an ecosystem, uh, sort of an integrated system? What does it mean for you guys? How should we be thinking about Evo Rails? Yeah, I mean, uh, to us, uh, it's about uh, end of the sand. You know, it's like when, when VMware starts talking about hyper-converged, and the array vendors start blogging about where you need hyper-converged, where you can't have hyper-converged, it actually is a problem for them because Parsing now- Parsing it, yeah. Exactly, so now when a big company like VMware starts talking about no need for a SAN, I think it's, it's actually a bigger trouble for uh, the arrays. And, I mean, I talk about this in another metaphor, talking about when Android and iPhone collided, they were competing, but the, the thing that they were really kind of sucking out the life out of was a PC. And that's what's going to happen with hyperconvergence, you know. We all visually look to be kind of colliding with VMware, like, oh, uh, Evo Rails is going to be death to Nutanix and so on, but the first thing that will die is the SAN. And that is what's going to be common about what we do and what VMware does. I mean, the more power we provide to the application guy, the virtualization guys, the more we can do top-down selling of storage, which is uh, very tightly coupled with applications, I think the more power it will give to this market as so well. So you're saying it's okay to be the Android or the iPhone, just don't want to yeah, be the x86 absolutely. desktop. Ab yeah, absolutely. Uh, talk about uh, your company. We were talking off camera and you, you told us that you, your, your organization is a little bit more transparent than most sort of startups and small companies. So share with us some performance metrics, you guys. Uh, whether it's headcount, you know, can you share with us revenue run rate, customers, sure. you know? Yeah, so uh, it's one of the things that we actually do really well, not just on the outside, but also in the inside. Uh, we talk about that with uh, our partners, like Dell, for example, you know, we have the CTO of Dell sitting here, Sam, and uh, we are very comfortable with Dell actually carrying an Evo Rail uh, kind of uh, platform, and also carrying a Nutanix, because eventually the dust will settle, and the true character of technologies and products will come out. And if you're not a good enough product, then we don't deserve to be actually being talked about at all. So this is a marathon, and we talk about that with Dell like that as well. So that's how we talk to partners, we talk to our employees about uh, you know, things like dilution and things like outstanding shares and, and stuff like that. Uh, to the rest of the world, we actually talk about the business. You know, like you know, Everybody is uh, like, no, we are a private company, we can't really talk about numbers. We go and talk numbers as well. Now someday it'll actually come to a little bit more guarded communication because of SEC and stuff right. like that. But until the time, we won't let the lawyers actually run this company. You know, I think. <laughs> I think <laughs> it sounds like Sergey and Larry like Google when they went I public. They wanted to do things differently. You guys got that same vibe there. Like, hey, you want to yeah, run? Yeah, and way? you know what? Our customers love it because when they see the size of the business, when they understand that we are open about revenue, open about number of customers, average deal sizes, repeat business. Uh, all this stuff, I mean, NPS scores, I mean, we are one of the rare few companies that really talk about NPS scores and customer sat and things like that. Because we're proud of those things, actually. You know? And there's nothing, uh, in fact, if there's something that we can't talk about, that must be something weak about us. And even that is out in the open. I mean, the Nutanix Bible, as, as a case in point, is a website that is uh, maintained by one of our architects. And it's one of the most heavily hit uh, Nutanix assets and it has every strength, every weakness of Nutanix technology. 
And we know that only with that kind of a transparency we can actually be a better product, better company. So flex some muscle a little bit for us. Obviously the financing speaks for itself in terms of you know, the bubble and the hype and everything, but that's validation. You have revenue run rate. How many customers do you have? Uh, how many customers over a million dollars do you have in the company? Sure. Uh, we actually talked about this in a press release about uh, 15, 20 days ago, but uh, as of July 31st, we had about 800 customers. We're adding about 200 to 250 logos a quarter. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of repeat customers. So about 70% of our customers actually come back and buy two times more in the first 12 months. Uh, and this has resulted in about uh, 29 to 30 million plus dollar customers for us. You know, so. Okay, so give us your take on VMware. We had Pat Gelsinger around talking about they're taking an offensive strategy. You're obviously a ship that's out there getting stronger and bigger floating out in the waters. Uh, eventually, right now, not near VMware in the ecosystem for sure. Um, what's your future look like relative to some of the other players? If you continue to go on this pace, um, it starts to get competitive. Um, you know, or I mean, does it? I saw, oh. I saw Cisco's booth up there, and it was a pretty big booth. And uh, Cisco and, uh, and VMware have coexisted. Now, it's going to be conceited of me to even compare Nutanix to what Cisco mm -hmm. is and what Cisco VMware look like, but I think good companies know how to coexist. I mean, just because Angela Merkel is talking to Putin doesn't mean that she's not a friend of the US or something, right? So I think just like geopolitics, this is the geopolitical environment that you see in the VM world here. And uh, I think good companies know what it means to uh, really uh, put partitions and boundaries and still be respectful well, of each other. Well, it's a growth other. market. Growth, growth cures all, all, all problems. Uh, when yeah, it starts absolutely. to get slower, maybe. But right now, yeah, we're absolutely. in a massive growth phase. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the way I look at, uh, you know, what VMware is doing is, as I just told Dave about it, that it's the beginning of the end of the sand, and, and that's what we will rejoice together, because the, <laughs> the well, enemy be, here well, be is... be specific. What do you mean by that? That's a good, that's a good point. What do you, describe why that's happening. Well, uh, the big reason for that is uh, empowerment and liberation. So if you go back to the days of NetApp, it was selling empowerment and liberation to the line of business by saying, here is a really easy, fast to deploy appliance that uh, will give you liberty over corporate IT so you don't have to beg, borrow, and steal block uh, storage or something. And it sold like hotcakes. You know, then came VMware and said, look guys, you don't have to wait for budgets, you can really start going and doing things like test and dev and pilots and things like that without really worrying about getting more servers. Microsoft did this uh, in a big way with respect to the other Unix ven vendors and with respect to systems management and so on. Liberation sells a lot, so when we go and go and Especially do, when it makes money for the customers. Absolutely, because you know, there are different words for it. It's time to value, speed to market, it's, but the real way to explain all of this phenomenon is human beings want empowerment. You know? And uh, hyperconvergence empowers the application user, empowers the virtualization user. The folks who really consume storage are the guys who actually end up buying it. So I think that's a big phenomenon and it's, it's more tied to the right brain of uh, humans as opposed to the left brain. It's not speeds and feeds. It's more about I can make my own decisions. I don't have to beg and borrow a storage from a right, store. So there are it? technical tailwinds too, right? I mean, you saw a function move out of the server and offload the, the CPU for good reason. Uh, and then this whole infrastructure built up around it. Uh, but it's clearly moving back. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, more and cores, I think you know, cheaper memories, flash. Absolutely. I mean, right. there's three things that we look at. One is virtualization became mature. Uh, so you can now run any and every app, not just the business apps, but storage as an app, for example, can now run inside uh, a hypervisor. 10 gigabit ethernet could now converge networks, so you don't need a separate uh, front plane and a separate back plane. You could converge them and use software-defined techniques to really uh, still keep them uh, separate. And lastly, the uh, advent of flash. I mean, there's so much silicon on the server that you can get hundreds of thousands of IOPS without really having to worry about going to a, an array itself. So you're, you're, I wonder if I could talk a little bit about the TAM. Uh, the, some of the trade press pickup this morning said you got the potential to become the next Oracle. Uh, now, of course, one of your investors perpetuated that, but nonetheless, the market's enormous for you guys. We've pegged it at a TAM of about 400 million. When, it's what it is if you add up all the storage and server. For and, a billion, and, you and, mean? And networking, 400 billion, sorry, did I say million? 400 billion, yeah, so enormous. Um, so, how should we be thinking about um, your approach to attacking that TAM? You've got everybody talking about the same benefits of converged. You throw in the word hyper-converged. So, help us understand the real difference and why you can continue to grow faster than some of the legacy guys. So, um, 
you know, TAM is historically a very lagging indicator of anything, you know. If you look at analyst reports uh, talking about ServiceNow, for example. Ah, absolutely, good still, example. Analysts still think that the Eight billion. I, ITSM market <laughs> yeah. is actually, uh, in fact, ServiceNow is only a billion and a half dollar TAM or something. Yeah, right, right, right. And right. you know what, I would take that any day than having to go and please an analyst to say, look, the TAM is really big. I'd rather go and have my sales force go and do the talking and say, well, you guys will know over time what the TAM really is. So I think the space that we are in, uh, the TAM is growing every year. It's all about workloads and use cases. If you keep expanding the scope of applications and the use cases and the workloads, all the TAM will come to us. And uh, that's, that's the way we look at it. I mean, it's about platforms, so you know, going after OEM model, for example, grows our TAM because we can't be everywhere Dell is. Uh, so there are places where we'll have to go and do what Dell does, for example, you know, and still be the piece of software. Because the place when you start to limit the TAM of any company is when you start to have religion. This is the one and only way you actually do things. Like Sun did this to itself. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, when it saw uh, x86 actually ramping up, they're like, oh, it's a toy. We actually are serious guys. We actually go and do big applications. Let the toy actually go and run. Ken Olsen kind of made that mistake too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> For you old guys in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the point is, you know, you keep growing the TAM by disrupting yourself. Uh, by doing an OEM deal with Dell, we sort of disrupted ourselves. But then we also said, if we don't disrupt ourselves, then someone else will, right? And that has massively grown the TAM of this company. Now we go after new workloads. We're going after you know, Exchange workloads and Microsoft and Oracle and all that stuff. You know, we'll go after NoSQL workloads relatively soon. Uh, I think there's all that stuff around workload expansion is what TAM really means. So help us understand why you guys are different, because everybody's using the same words, same marketing messages. What makes Nutanix different? Uh, I, I blogged about this today as well, uh, so it's fresh in my mind. I think the two things that we do are really, I mean, and this is on the product side, you know. Obviously there's more on the business side that uh, I think we do okay and can do even better over time. Execution stuff you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, so on the product side, the two things that we've done well and have passion for is consumer grade design and web scale engineering. So you know, you get the right brain of uh, Apple and the left brain of Google. Can you meld these two together and bring it to the enterprise actually? So, and we are a very well balanced company at that. You know, we have tons of people who just think about design, design, design. There's tons of people who think about how do you make it scalable and available and reliable. So on the product side, we actually do a pretty good job of that. Now on the execution side, you know, we have our VP of support and ops sitting here, uh, David Sangster. We really own support. We absolutely own support better than most companies ever can. You know? And if there's an escalation or two or whatever, I think all of us are equally involved in that. NPS scores are pretty big. I mean, when we lead with uh, Nutanix story, we talk about the product and technology but we also talk about support. And together they actually become a really uh, good combination. Yeah, I talked to a couple of customers this week. One was the CIO of San Mateo County, and, and uh, the other one was from Australia. I forget, it was Langs, maybe? Langs, maybe, yeah. yeah. And both of them sort of underscore that, so you know, props to being a partner and not yeah. just a And I think on the, in, on the internal, I think you know, we at least strive to value employees and value customers and value partners. I think uh, if we have empathy for these stakeholders, I think eventually things work out. I mean, a lot of companies start to go the other way when they start to just empathize uh, stockholders and not the other stakeholders, yeah. like employees and customers and partners, and that's when things start to go wrong, actually. Raj, I want to ask you about the culture uh, around the company, obviously, uh, and how it relates to some of the trends. You mentioned that people are aware and, and, and transparent, uh, and fear of, uh, being paranoid, as Andy Grove would say, it sounds like a little bit of Andy Grove mentality here. So, with that in mind, I got to ask you: You guys were one of those companies that no one understood, you know, the misfit toys at the beginning of the financing journey. What is this new tonus? Will it work? And you and I have talked about that. Now, obviously, the, the success is proven, and everyone's trying to be like you. In an er era of automation, orchestration, things go away. Jobs go away. Um, things are displaced or automated, and the shift goes to other places. So, where do you see? the shifting happening. If the software stack continues, if the DevOps continues to happen, the containerization, some of the intelligence around analytics, where does the shift go to? Where will the innovation happen that's, that's unique, that's not yet seen by people? What's your vision? Is it going to be security, other problems? I mean, no one really gets fired, they just shift to other places. Yeah, you know, uh, phones were also an invention for the longest time. For decades, we, people, we kept tweaking on phones, it became cordless, and you, you had these big satellite phones, and then 
3G arrived in the scene and people started talking about smartphones and so on. So uh, anything that we use on a day-to-day -day basis will continue to get better. Uh, today we have tons of people in a data center. Tomorrow we won't have as many people in data center because you use big data techniques and machine learning and artificial intelligence to do more and more. Managing volumes, the little thing, yeah. administrative I mean, those stuff. Those things you take away. I think you know, as a company we believe that storage should become an invisible resource in the data center, you know, and how do you take that away? But the, the way we're approaching this whole thing where uh, humans are less and less involved in, uh, with machines is uh, a very humane approach around education uh, and uh, enablement. Because the same people can now do better things. Like the storage guys can uplift themselves to do more application work, more virtualization work, more hybrid computing work, and so on. So Nutanix is a massive investment in education. It's a pretty big part of our overall uh, I would say initiative. It's not just product and technology and support. What can we do to uplift uh, and elevate the lives of people whose jobs you might be taking away today? Where do you see some of the early signs there in terms of job shifting and job retraining? Is it the DBA moving over to something else? Is it big data? I mean, what, what, what early indicators can you point to now that's saying this is actually happening now, people are moving and shifting? Well, you just look at the vCenter plugins around storage and networking, and you know that there is a convergence of uh, responsibilities going on right now. I mean, the big fight between Cisco and VMware is about who owns networking. Because East-West is like, okay, VMware says we own it, and North-South is like, Cisco is like, well, we actually own it. So until you have the North-South, you can't get East-West to even work together. How about that statement by Pat, we love Cisco gear. Kind of a little T positioning See, I, there, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, so I think, I mean, and both are equally important. Gear company. Uh, but you know, coming back to your, uh, your uh, question on uh, how the responsibilities and the roles are actually converging, I think that's a pretty good uh, indication of where things are going. Yeah. D. Raj, always uh, great to have you on theCUBE. Um, it's a pleasure to talk with you. I mean, you've had such a great success and, and you really built a great company. Congratulations. I think this is just the beginning. Uh, great to hear the stories and the insight around the success of Nutanix. And, and again, congratulations. Great to follow you guys. Um, this is theCUBE live in San Francisco. We'll be right back with our next guest after this short break. <laughs>